Hello, uh, welcome everyone to the webinar Riding the Wave of Innovation in Floating Solar, uh, the latest design methodologies for anchoring systems. Very glad you are joining us today. Uh, my name is Manuela, I'm a project manager at Solar Plaza, and uh, together with my colleague Tom, who is here in the background, uh, helping us uh, with some technical, uh, technical questions. We are going to introduce this nice webinar today with a very nice lineup of experts. I'm happy to see that we already have quite some uh, professionals and floating solar enthusiasts that are joining us today. Um, and I would like to start by giving you an overview of what we're going to be talking about today. Sorry, jumped ahead a bit. <laughs> so uh, yeah, just as I said, I'm going to be giving a short introduction. And uh, the topic of this webinar today, we're going to be talking about the design challenges and of course, some interesting solutions for anchoring and mooring systems in floating solar. And I'm here today with quite the experts in the field. Uh, so we are going to have uh, Michele Tagliapietra from DNP who will be moderating the session today. And uh, we will start with a few presentations. So we'll start with Kane Wang from SunGrow giving a, a presentation about some interesting case studies in Asia, who will be followed then by Tore Wardvik from DNP as well. And we will be closing up the presentations with Charles Gary from CFLEX. And after that, Michele will be conducting the discussion in which you can also uh, send your questions and we'll be very happy to answer them. Uh, so that's what's gonna be today, the lineup of this webinar. And to give you a little bit of an idea about Solar Plaza for those who don't know us yet. So our mission is to actually positively impact the world by accelerating the renewable energy transition. And we do that through sharing knowledge and connecting multiple stakeholders in the renewable energy industry. And of course, this happens through our physical and virtual events, but also through the resources we publish in our channels uh, throughout the year. Uh, so you can see that we already uh, have organized more than 150 events and in more than 41 countries worldwide. So that's a bit of what we do. And of course, this uh, webinar, very important to say that this webinar is leading up to our third global floating solar conference, which this year will happen uh, on the 28th of September in Amsterdam. Uh, we'll be receiving over 200 stakeholders in the solar industry. And we are at the moment preparing a very insightful program. So uh, please stay tuned for more information about the event through our website, which you can also see on the slide over there. Uh, and about some practical notes. If you have any questions that you would like to send to be answered at the end for the Q&A session, please use the chat box you see in the right corner of your screen. Uh, if you are having any technical issues, please also let us know via the chat box. And of course, we will do our best to help you. And uh, a nice one, of course, to mention is that the slides, uh, the presentation will be uh, really available for you afterwards and you will be receiving an email with all the details. So, uh, Enough of the practical sides. I would like to start uh, kicking off the session by introducing our moderator today, uh, Michele Tagliapietra. He's a solar consultant at DNP. Uh, he has been working for uh, three years already in floating solar projects. And we can already see him coming up at the screen. <laughs> and uh, Michele, he works also as project manager and the technical consultant in due diligence projects, uh, feasibility and market studies, and among many others. So Michele has also been actively promoting a more standardization and knowledge sharing in the floating solar industry. So uh, a real advocate, I would say. <laughs> Michele, the floor is yours. Welcome. 
Thank you very much, uh, Manuela. I hope you can hear me now. And uh, it's uh, an honor to be here moderating this uh, discussion today with uh, uh, such uh, big experts in uh, anchoring the moon for uh, floating solar. So I will not uh, waste too much time and I will uh, start introducing already the first of our uh, speakers, which is Kane Wang from uh, Sangro. He has more than six years of experience in uh, floating solar developing a variety of uh, floating products and solutions, focusing on the optimization of anchorage systems and offshore floating solar solutions. He also participated in a top runner program in China for uh, floating solar and joined the formulation of uh, uh, domestic floating solar standards in the Chinese market, helping the development of uh, uh, floating solar in China with uh, uh, a lot of installations that we have seen in the previous years. So uh, I leave the floor now to uh, Kane to tell us a little bit more about uh, Sandro's anchoring solution and some case studies. Kane, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, can I start? start it? Okay. okay uh, thanks for uh, Mikia uh, kind uh, introduction. Uh, I'm Kane, and today my presentation will focus on the methodology of the anchor system and the case studies. And uh, uh, my presentation is consist of the uh, three parts. The uh, first is a brief introduction of the company review for Sangro FPV, and the second shows the methodology of the anchor design, including the summary of the uh, per uh, design process and the load calculation. The, some of the our experiment will be shown in this part, and the case study will be the last part. Uh, 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 at this at this uh, part. Uh, uh, we will uh, take two typically uh, project. Uh, one of it uh, is the had conducted at the industrial impony reservoir in Thailand uh, with a high level uh, water variation and the irregular air area. And the uh, another is the world biggest project uh, in the uh, uh, East Asia uh, so far, and still be the world largest uh, project in the strength and the typhoon make us to use some special solution. Okay, uh, Sangro. Oh, wait a minute. Okay, Sangro FPV was. Uh, uh, okay, okay, it's a, it's a little problem. Okay, uh, Sangro FPV was established in 2016, and up to now uh, we have already applied over 1.1 gigawatts all over the world, and uh, uh, which let us uh, still be the. Uh, top one floating solar supplier, uh, except uh, supp uh, except uh, provide the um, floating product. We also providing the one stop uh, solution for anchoring design uh, to our customers, and uh, uh, we taking the, we taking the lead of the first standard of the anchor design uh, in China. And uh, in the meantime, we are collaborating with the DMV uh, at the anchoring methodology uh, verification, and now. Uh, Sangro FPV has successfully applied over uh, 150 uh, projects uh, all over the world uh, without an accident. Uh, okay, let's move to the anchor design methodology. Uh, we can see that uh, there is a, a brief introduction of the uh, design progress, uh, including the, uh, uh, including the uh, that includes a primary design and the uh, detailed design. And uh, uh, we should uh, collect the information of the uh, geology and the, uh, and the wind current speed and wave height. And after that, so we can do the primary design. Uh, the primary anchoring layout will be given, given out. And if we uh, want to do the uh, uh, construction, then we, need, we can do the uh, detailed design and do some uh, coupling analysis to optimize the, our anchor design. Uh, as we know, the, uh, the wind lord is the main lord of the area, uh, the PV area. Uh, so uh, in this page, we, uh, we can see that Sangro has uh, uh, confirmed a, a single and the uh, array wind channel ex uh, experiment and to in order to research the shape and the shelter factor. Uh, let us focus on the top right of the picture. Uh, the curve shows that the shape factor 
the changes with the different PV inclination and the wind direction. And uh, after the, uh, as for the shear factor, uh, we can see that it shows the stability after the five rows of the PV array. Okay, uh, according to the result of the experiment, uh, we can correct our CFD method. Uh, it also shows the uh, uh, shared uh, phenomenon of the wave and current. First, uh, we will calculate the wave height and uh, the current speed that are caused by the wind. Uh, combined with the floating array, uh, CFT method was used to calculate the wave and current load. A uh, wave and the uh, current and the wind load cannot be applied uh, uh, neither superposition uh, directly, it should be uh, coupled uh, in hydrodynamic software. Uh, first, uh, we set the array and the anchor design uh, the, and then set up the load and some uh, parameters. Uh, the first and the moment will be, uh, can be exported from the result documents. Okay, when it comes to the uh, foundation, uh, we also did uh, some research of the dead weight anchor. Uh, we consider the features of the volume, shape, and the shell key, and the combi uh, combination of the above. And before the test, uh, we it did a fairly uh, geological uh, prospection in order to correct the, the theory of the calculation. Uh, after this pro experiment, we found a few uh, interesting conclusions. Uh, for example, the shape of the uh, data uh, rectangular are better than the trapezoid, and uh, the shear key uh, take a little effect uh, in word. Uh, okay, the the last uh, part in methodology of the angry design I want to share is the uh, angry design software that self -deve self developed by the Sangro FPV. Uh, this software contains our uh, research result and the product specification. Uh, and uh, we can use the, this software to export the minimum uh, number of the accurate point very quickly. Okay, next, uh, uh, the last part, I will take two typically project to, uh, for example, to analysis. Uh, the first uh, is the project on industrial impounding reservoir in Thailand and is uh, consists of the three independent uh, area with the total capacity 12.5 megawatts. Uh, there's a few difficulty uh, like the irregular shape and 40 meters uh, water variation and the limited area to apply the PV panel. Okay, uh, consider considering above a point we decide to Use the shore anchor to uh, shore anchor to increase the uh, the radius of the anchor point and to decrease the uh, draft of the floating area. So uh, so that enough water area could be used to apply PV panel as much as possible. Uh, but even we take the shore anchor, it still need to apply the irregular area design to meet the capacity. So we try to make the radius of the anchor uh, consistently in one side. And until now, this project uh, had operated two years separately. Okay, the second uh, uh, project is an offshore FPV uh, in East Asia. Uh, so far, it is still be the world largest FPV project uh, with a capacity of the, uh, 181 megawatts. Uh, solid water with the typhoon, uh, we can see the strand two times uh, a day and the limited area mm, to uh, are making this project uh, be one of the most difficult projects all over the world. Okay, due, uh, due to the geology of the MERD that uh, we decided to choose the dead with anchor, uh, considering the salty water that we used uh, the polymer anchoring cable. And one of the problem is the lifting when the PV array uh, stranded on the ground. When it happens, the angry uh, cable shows slack and uh, no use for the edge of the north PV area. Uh, actually, we need to make the downward first 
uh, biggest answer upward first at the edge of the North PV array. So for this problem, we uh, okay. So for this problem, we had proposed uh, two solutions. Uh, one of which uh, was to make the North PV array uh, in op opposite, uh, like the top left uh, picture. And uh, because when the wind comes from the north, it will induce the downward force in first array to balance the upward force in the next few array. Uh, uh, okay, there's another solution to solve this problem. Uh, for example, filling the water into the floating body to increase the weight of the to in, in, increase the weight to against the, the uh, upward force that are caused by the wind. Uh, and the next problem we think that is the big single PV uh, array with the 18 megawatts. Uh, it shows a rectangular, uh, so that there's not enough agree point uh, in the west and the east side, but uh, we have the enough uh, anchor point in the south and the west, uh, north side. So we make the length of the, the north source uh, anchor cable longer than the east and the west. So when wind comes from the west or east, the load will act on the north and south side anchor first. Uh, so because of the enough anchor point, the load will uh, split, uh, split it uh, homogeneous and meet the requirement of the uh, of the floating body. Uh, okay, thanks for uh, listening to my brief presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Kane, for the interesting presentation on your uh, uh, anchoring methodology in your uh, projects. And uh, uh, now we can move to the next uh, uh, speaker, which will be uh, Ture uh, Orwick, our own Ture from uh, DMV. Is a principal consultant in uh, renewables projects and he holds a master degree in marine technology with a specialization in hydrodynamics. He has been working for uh, more than 10 years uh, with mooring system review, analysis and qualification of components and he has a vast knowledge of uh, mooring systems for different kind of floating structures within uh, oil and gas, fish farming, uh, floating wind and floating solar. He was also one of the main contributors to the DMBGL recommended practice and is going to tell us something more about that. But before uh, he starts uh, presenting, uh, he wanted to ask uh, a quick question. So there is a poll uh, for you uh, that should be uh, now showing up in the screen. It's a really simple one. Uh, so uh, we would like to know if you have experience yourself with design of anchoring and or mooring for floating PV systems. It's a pretty uh, straightforward question. Just to understand uh, uh, what is the uh, level of, uh, of knowledge or the uh, kind of uh, people that are listening to this webinar uh, today, so that we can also see if to go uh, too much uh, into uh, technical details or keep it more uh, high level. In general, floating solar industry is quite a young one, so uh, we, we know that the experience still needs to, uh, to be developed. And I think that's reflected by the results. So 69% uh, of you do not have experience with design and, and uh, of anchoring a mooring system. So I think there will be a lot to be learned today from uh, Ture, Kane and, and Charles. So now I leave the word back to uh, Ture so that he can tell us a bit more about the recommended practice and anchoring a mooring for floating The floor is yours. Uh, thanks for the introduction, uh, Michaela. Um, so in my uh, presentation, I will uh, talk a little bit about uh, anchoring and mooring from uh, DMV's uh, perspective. Uh, firstly, I would like to briefly mention our involvement within floating solar. So DMV has a worldwide presence within renewables and we have more than 1000 experts in 50 locations. So for floating solar, we deliver services across the whole uh, value chain. Uh, our main services include technical advisory services, for instance, early stage feasibility studies and other technical studies. And then we do third party services like verification, technology qualification, testing and due diligence. And we provide market insights through market studies, technology benchmarking and also cost modeling. 
And lastly, we are also involved in the operational phase where we can do performance validation on potential failure analysis. So many of you have heard about the DMV recommended practice for design development and operation of floating solar PV systems. Uh, and this RP was developed uh, through a joint industry project led by Michele, uh, together with 24 industry partners as shown here. And in addition, we had more than 20 other companies that have contributed to the RP as external reviewers. Uh, this RP is the first of its kind within floating solar uh, and as such mark an important step towards standardization of the industry. Although it has just been released, the RP is already widely in use and we get a lot of uh, questions. One example already mentioned by Kane is that we are currently carrying out a verification of SunGrove's methodology for design of anchoring and mooring, basing that verification on this RP. Yeah, so the recommended practice provide the industry with a comprehensive set of requirements, recommendations and guidelines for the whole life cycle of these projects. And the requirements are technology agnostic and location neutral, so you should be able to apply it to any project. And the scope uh, and validity... No, I jumped, sorry. Uh, the scope and validity uh, of the RP includes uh, projects in inland and near shore water bodies. You can find the RP free at the DMV uh, online uh, page. Yeah. So the recommended practice is intended to provide requirements and guidance that are relevant for all the different phases in uh, project development. So starting at the left with feasibility and concept, we provide uh, guidance on site conditions. And then we also provide guidance on permitting, environmental impact and energy yield analysis. And then moving one step to the right, we are in the design phase. And this is where the RP provides detailed requirements and even safety factors for design. And electrical design is included as well. And then once the system is designed, the next step is to install and operate. And we have a specific uh, chapter on that. And then the last part of the RP is decommissioning in a safe and efficient manner. And then health and safety issues that are kind of working across all the project phases. Lastly, I wanted to provide you with some of the key factors we in DMV consider important when designing mooring systems for floating PV systems. Uh, first of all, it is absolutely essential that the site conditions are known and as soon as possible, preferably before feasibility stage. So the most important site conditions to obtain for anchoring and mooring is the water depth, bathymetry and soil conditions, and of course water level variation and data on wind speed and wave heights. If there are high uncertainties in the site data, you should apply more conservative assumptions in your design. Secondly, you need to define uh, design criteria or design basis for the anchoring and mooring prior to doing the actual design. So what kind of floats will be used, what water level variation needs to be accommodated, what are the requirements to the power cable with respect to motions, is it possible to use shore moorings, these are questions that should be answered in a design basis. And then you need to do a proper load assessment. You should then apply a methodology that is able to capture the physical effects that are present in your case. That means, for instance, if you have waves, you should preferably run dynamic analysis to get good estimates of the motions and mooring loads. And when you have estimated the loads, you can then uh, do an assessment to make sure that the capacity of your components and anchors are sufficiently large, which is why your capacity should be larger than the loads multiplied with a safety factor. One uh, potential risk aspect that is not talked so much about is how the interfaces are handled. 
So in a project, there might be someone that are delivering the floats. Then you have others that are uh, involved with mooring design. Someone else is delivering components. And lastly, someone de delivering the anchors. And all these things work together uh, and will influence each other. So it is therefore essential that someone has to fill overview and make sure that the flow of information and load estimates are properly shared between the different parties. A proper installation is really key to ensure the mooring system actually performs the way it was designed. So the anchor positions and line lengths need to be uh, within the defined tolerances to get the loads you have assumed in design. And also you need to be careful not to get any twists or damages in the mooring lines uh, during installation because that will significantly reduce the capacity of those components. Lastly, uh, the operation and maintenance phase uh, is the most important phase. That's where you produce and it needs to be really considered already in design. So the mooring system needs to be designed to have easy access for inspection and repairs. And you need to think of methods for detecting line failures and a spare part philosophy should also be defined. So finally, I would advise you to check the requirements in the RP when designing the mooring system, because there you find all this and much more information. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Tour, for the, this uh, brief presentation of the recommended practice and the main uh, uh, key factors to consider in the design of uh, uh, floating solar anchoring and mooring systems. And uh, uh, I believe uh, also the next speaker has something to say about uh, what can be the issues in a uh, mooring system on floating PV. So uh, the next in line is uh, uh, Charles Gary from uh, CPLEX. Uh, he focuses on the floating PV business development and technical project management. Uh, is a contributing member to a number of floating fee publications, including the uh, series Handbook for Practitioners, the Fresher uh, EU Research Project, and uh, our own DMV uh, floating solar recommended practice. He has a background in sales management and business development from uh, his experience in various industries, including automobile, environment, environmental testing, government, and logistics. Uh, also, Charles uh, has a question, uh, a poll for you to answer before he starts uh, uh, speaking. So if we can get the poll uh, running. Uh, so what is, in your opinion, the biggest design risk associated with static cables and rope mooring solutions? This is a pretty technical question, and uh, uh, I am sure that uh, uh, Charles uh, has his own answer to that, and he will uh, uh, shed uh, more light on that during his presentation. But we wanted also to hear what's your opinion on what may be the biggest design risks uh, with the static cables and rope mooring solutions. We will leave you a few seconds to uh, read and uh, think about the question, and then let's see if your answer will match with the uh, opinion from uh, Charles. Okay, so uh, the most popular answer is uneven force distribution within between the different mooring lines, and I believe that Charles will agree with this, but I will. Uh, let him uh, say something more about it uh, and uh, leave him the floor. Charles, please go ahead. Great, thank you, Michele, for the introduction, and thank you, Solar Plaza, for having me today. Um, and yes, I agree with the audience that um, one of the biggest risks for a static uh, system with ropes and cables and chains is this uneven distribution of force. Um, but I'm going to back up one second and just uh, give everybody a, a brief definition of what static material is. So rope, uh, cable, and chain are, are not elastic. Um, rope may stretch a little bit uh, and return a little bit to um, its shape, but it won't ever return to its uh, normal shape, its beginning shape. Um, so it's not really considered an elastic material. Uh, it's an elongating material. So just wanted to clear that up. That's a, a common mistake that we hear a lot of people make. So going into this a little bit more um, in what the design functions um, mean to different materials. Uh, an uneven force distribution for static materials is one of those real risks that we're seeing more and more in the marketplace. Uh, when you have projects that have a small amount of water level variation, a couple of centimeters, and a smaller uh, lower wind forces, 
then you often see that, that the cables and chains and ropes can be used. Uh, they can use, be used in a horizontal orientation with mooring or a seabed floor anchoring bottom mooring, and they're okay. Um, but when you start to get into projects with larger amounts of variations, uh, half a meter, a meter or more, uh, then you're going to have to have cables, uh, ropes and chains that have a catenary line. They have slack in the lines. That is necessary in order to be able to handle the variation up and down that the water is going. So when you combine this with a wind force, a significant wind force, and in Europe we have somewhere between 25 and 35 meters per second winds and storms, uh, this is a, an unsafe situation for this type of material because of this uneven force distribution. And I'm going to give, the, give you an example of what that means in terms of uh, the technical side. So if you designed your floating solar platform uh, to have attachment point strengths of two tons, uh, per attachment point on the floats, and then you have a total of 14 tons, then you split it with these seven lines. So the total wind force on the platform would be 14 tons, and it's equally split here as my design on the computer screen. But what actually happens when you go to install anchors on the seabed floor, and they can be a little bit higher, a little bit lower, this can be a little bit farther out, a little bit farther in, then you end up with the mooring lines not being all the same length. And when you have to have slack in the mooring lines, it's really impossible to make them the same length when you're trying to install them on a floating uh, platform. So what you do is you end up getting some cables that enact first. So this would be the shortest one, for example, and this one and this one. And then instead of splitting 14 tons by seven, you're only splitting 14 tons by three lines, which means they're holding 4.6 tons each, which is way over the um, maximum ability of each attachment point. And when that happens, sorry, wrong button. When that happens, you can see that they'll break. And then when they break on that side, then maybe only two attachment points or two lines are holding, which are the shortest lines. And that's seven tons on something that's only supposed to hold two tons. And then, of course, down and down and down, you'll get to uh, zero. And when that happens, of course, you have no nothing holding the platform anymore. So this is one of the real challenges between um, working on the computer uh, and designing on the computer and evenly distributing and doing simulations and actually being in the field and seeing a completely different result. And that's something that CFLEX 40 years of experience have taught us. Uh, going out in the field and having these projects is something that's really important to do. Getting a company that's had ex experience with mooring for a long time is really important to do. And in a very young industry, that's not the case most of the time. So when you have projects that are in very calm areas, they'll work fine. They'll be 25 years, use, use ropes, chains, cables, no problem. When you start to have water level variation and winds, then you're gonna have to change to something different because in reality, the computer model, models that we've been seeing haven't, haven't followed what's happening in the storms. Another consequence of this is in order for cables and chains and ropes to even come close to a, a safe, um, even distribution, you would have to have a huge amount of anchors, a huge amount of ropes and cables, and a huge amount of attachment points uh, on these solar islands. And what the problem with that is, is that gets very expensive. Placement of anchors gets expensive with the labor of the anchors themselves. And of course, the O&M on cables and chains and ropes is not so cheap when you're having to replace them over 25 years. So you can see the difference between that and something like the C-Flex type of installation with elastic. Very few anchors, very few mooring lines, uh, but very we can use a lot of attachment points on the floats to help distribute the force. And the good thing with C-Flex is because it's elastic, it has an automatic even distribution of force to the platform. You don't have the same problems that cables and ropes and chains have with an uneven force. The elastic material allows for the automatic distribution of these loads. And then to go one step even further, C-Flex has gone to create uh, what we call a new multi-connector um, attachment, and that allows for even more attachment points to be used uh, with systems. So further reducing the C-Flex uh, anchors uh, and the mooring lines and creating more attachment points and spreading more distributions of forces. So this is a really important um, innovation that we've come up with uh, through many of our projects, through many of our research projects in the EU. 
um, and we feel like that this is going to be a, a very, a very, very interesting um, and lowering of costs solution uh, that's going to work with a number of upcoming projects uh, to show that the mooring and anchoring system can constantly be um, improved to reduce in cost and uh, increase in technical and safety, uh, lowering the risks, making these projects more bankable, uh, better insurable, and just uh, bringing the whole industry up a, up a notch in, in feasibility. So we look forward to um, sharing some uh, projects with this in the upcoming months. And um, yes, again, thank you very much for the time and looking forward to everybody's questions um, with mooring and anchoring. very much, uh, Charles, for an interesting uh, presentation on uh, your uh, alternative solution for uh, mooring of floating solar. And uh, uh, I think we can uh, now start with the uh, panel discussion and with a, a more open uh, Q&A. So uh, maybe it's good if uh, all the all of the speakers uh, come back, uh, uh, let's say, online with their camera on so we can uh, uh, see each other and have a more open discussion. I see that two have popped up already. Here is Charles again, and uh, also Kane should join uh, soon, but I will already start uh, with a uh, question for uh, Ture, uh, also building up on the uh, last thing that uh, Charles said, uh, so about the uh, floating solar being a young industry with still a lot of lessons to be learned. In this uh, young industry, why do you think it's so important to have a standard uh, for design for anchoring and mooring of, of floating systems. How can this help? Yeah, uh, no, I think that's a that's a really good question, and uh, I think for floating solar, it's really interesting to see how quickly this uh, industry has matured from R and D and into full commercialization, and kind of the regulations uh, are not really up to speed uh, i mean the, the the project development is going faster than the than the regulations in a way uh, so i think it will be a lot of benefits for all the different players to to establish a common approach on how how to design these systems we see that as well from other renewable industries like floating wind that the standards are really good for the whole supply chain to to talk the same language some some key things I think is important with the standard is, is and a big upside is that uh, this was uh, discussed as well by Charles that it will really de-risk the whole industry to make it more uh, attractive to investors and lenders uh, and as well for local authorities right they it would be easier to to sanction these projects I guess if if it's you know that they are developed in accordance with the uh, recognized standards. And then as well for developers and contractors, uh, it will be easier to define the requirements uh, that you should uh, adhere to. So, so scoping actually uh, the work would be better. And then uh, technically, technically, of course, uh, hope it will make a more consistent safety level of the different designs. Right now, I think there are many systems out there that are completely over-designed and maybe unfortunately some systems that are underdimensioned. And this is probably not done on purpose, but when you mix and match standards from everywhere, you will not, you don't really know what the safety level of your design is. But if we make like an optimized standard for floating solar, it would be much more consistent design at the cost optimal level. And that's the last point that I think it will contribute to lower costs as well, because at least after some time, you would be able to streamline the design procedures uh, and uh, streamline manufacturing and installation. And then one really key thing about standards is that standards should not uh, kill innovation in a way. Good standards should allow and, and uh, really uh, accommodate innovation so uh, so it's not that fact that you have standards does not mean that the industry has converged uh, you can still have a lot of innovation even though 
you have certain requirements to uh, to adhere to. Yeah. So I think that's that's the key benefits at least with with having a design standard in place. Thank you very much, Tore. And you mentioned uh, uh, both investors and uh, uh, lowering costs. So one thing that uh, uh, I'm curious to ask uh, uh, Charles is uh, what are the, uh, let's say, the cost comparison between uh, static mooring system and uh, an elastic mooring system, such as the one you, uh, you described in your presentation? Can you tell us more about that? Yes, that's a very common question that I that I get. Um, and looking at designs, it makes a lot of difference on the design, what the project location is. Um, like again, if it's a very calm environment um, where they don't need to have much water level variation, low winds, uh, static systems can be perfectly fine. They can be the most economical systems to use. And uh, we, we do give that advice and recommendation sometimes. So from projects that we are asked for. But when you start to move up in harsher environments, it actually flips. Um, because there's such a need for uh, redundancy and safety level for static cable systems in harsher environments, it can actually be where the, the C-Flex system for CAPEX and OPEX uh, with the anchoring, uh, with the moorings lines, with installation costs, that um, a progressive elastic system is much uh, less expensive uh, in those situations than a static cable system. So it's just depending on the on the environment uh, what the project location is um, but it's um, but it's very interesting we come across sometimes people are, are actually very pleasantly surprised at how uh, inexpensive uh, an elastic mooring system can be on their project uh, compared to what the static solution um, needs to be in order to handle those uh, forces and the safety factors thank you very much charles and uh, uh, moving to uh to Kane again, uh, you have a lot of experience with uh, really a, a lot of installations, especially in, in the Asian market, and you explained about the, your uh, design and methodology. But from this experience, what are the key factors that uh, developers should take into account in the anchoring and mooring design? Uh, okay, thank you, Miguel. Uh, first, I think uh, we should pay attention to the collection of the information, like the geology and uh, uh, the water level variation and the speed of the wind and it should be the uh, it should be accurate and uh, comprehensive uh, and the, another point uh, I think uh, is uh, uh, we should concern is about the calculation and we need to overcome the uneven force and uh, the set factor is also important to, for example that we can apply the uh, 2.0 for the anchoring cable and the 1.3 for the foundation and uh, exact right. yes thank you thank you kane and since you mentioned calculation there was a question from uh, from the audience which was uh, asking uh, which uh, software modeling tool uh, you use in sangro for the uh, anchoring design that you showed in the slides could you give us uh, uh, say some example or explanation of the tools that you use internally Uh, okay, it's about the anchor software, design software, right? Yeah. Which which software do you use? Uh, we just uh, self-developed. Okay, and uh, uh, we can use some of the uh, we combine the experiment uh, its result and the specification for our product, and uh, we can we also use some CFD CFD software. Yes, right. Okay. Staying on the on the software um, topic, uh, there was a question uh, also about uh, uh, DMB's SESAM analysis program. It's quite a long one. Uh, so uh, John says that uh, SESAM analysis program can be used for analyzing mooring, uh, uh, anchoring uh, for floating PV, uh, and is asking Ture. Uh, if this can be used and uh, um, if the program has been calibrated with the real world data such as uh, measurements from uh, test tank data or array measurements specifically for floating solar or if this is uh, uh, in the making for the future yeah uh, yeah so uh, so with regards to software uh, and applicability i think it's really project dependent as well right in some uh, cases you, you can apply uh, really 
simplified spreadsheet analysis uh, even, but in other cases, especially where you have significant dynamic effects, you, we would recommend to use uh, a proper dynamic analysis uh, program. And yeah, the CSM package uh, from DMV uh, uh, would be appropriate uh, to use. There are also other programs from other uh, suppliers uh, that can be used. Um, we recommend to use uh, time domain uh, analysis uh, programs. Uh, for the question whether uh, it is calibrated with uh, based on measurements, uh, there are some, not currently, there are ongoing projects uh, as we speak. Uh, so um, there will come new releases in our CSM project. Uh, programs that are uh, call it tailor made for floating solar applications. So um, stay tuned for that. And uh, another uh, maybe more general question: uh, It's what are the typical anchor types and mooring lines in use in floating solar, and what are the maximum environmental conditions that can be taken normally by the systems? Uh, I don't know, Charles, you want to uh, to answer that on the anchors uh, that are normally coupled with your CPEC system or? Sure, I can, I can take a brief shot at this one. Um, there are a lot of different types of anchors that can be used. Uh, there are concrete deadweight anchors, uh, percussion anchors, drill anchors, helical anchors. Um, the, the very different uh, types of anchors have different positive and negatives. Um, so for example, a deadweight anchor even if the, um, the dead weight anchor moves a little bit on the seabed floor, it still has a, a residual pulling effect. It still has a um, ability to keep the stationary, the, the, the island stationary, but uh, in, in retrospect, in, in a, a, a pile anchor or a, a screw anchor, a helical anchor, if it pulls up, it has no capacity whatsoever anymore. So there's uh, very different positive and negatives on different types of anchors. So. The environment, well, it's mostly the seabed floor, the composition of the soil for its holding capacity is what determines maybe what the best anchor solution is along with the risk factor of it being pulled out or not. Um, and then all, all the mooring lines can attach to all of the all of the anchors. So whether it's a rope anchor, cable anchor, C-flex anchor, elastic, they can all attach to, to, to any of them. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, uh... Charles, do you want to add something on that uh, uh, Toure or Kane uh, on the uh, mooring lines? Yeah, I can go ahead uh, to, to add to what Charles uh, said uh, with respect to mooring lines. I mean, it's uh, more an optimization issue. I mean, uh, wire, chain, uh, ropes, uh, flex elements, you basically you need to design a system that meets your uh, your criteria with respect, design criteria, cost criteria, uh, you, your uh, requirements to how much maintenance you you want to have. So basically, it's the it's no kind of exact answer on what kind of uh, mooring line components to use. It would be project specific. But there was a question on the environmental conditions, uh, and. Um, to be frank, there is no upper limit, I would say. It's more, a, we have the methodology to design forever, uh, for whatever metocean conditions and environmental conditions we want. Uh, it's more a cost issue. So there are examples now of uh, projects, uh, pilot projects, research projects uh, offshore, right? Uh, up in uh, wave heights up to six, seven, eight meters. Uh, but they, those projects, of course, are a long, uh, it's a long way to having those projects being commercially rapidly because the costs will, of course, increase. But uh, in general, I would say like that, that there are not any, uh, rest, uh, on the technology side, there are not so many limitations to environmental conditions. You just need to, account for it then in the sign. Yeah, I think maybe to add on that, it's also, uh, let's say, really important to uh, understand and ask to your uh, providers and your uh, suppliers exactly what 
uh, environmental condition their system is designed for because it's important to choose the right solution for the right environmental conditions so that uh, let's say it's possible to avoid bad surprises uh, after two three or four years of uh, of operation. Uh, you mentioned the offshore uh, floating solar, Ture, and uh, we have a question uh, re directed to Sangro. Uh, so most of your systems uh, are in uh, uh, inland or near shore water bodies. Uh, Purst, uh, sorry if I pronounced the name uh, not correctly, is asking if uh, you are also dealing with floating solar for maritime applications in open sea and if you are planning to do that in the future. Uh, okay, uh, for the open sea the environment, and uh, uh, we also consider we also should consider the the, the typhoon and the, the and, and the wave conducted by the, the high speed wind, and uh, in in this solution that uh, Sangro has already uh, researched uh, some the wave breaker uh, to overcome the wave condition, and. Uh, and we also should to consider the uh, corrosion of the uh, of the sort, uh, caused by the salty, and uh, we need to use the maybe the polymer uh, angry cable and the uh, the, the three one six L and the chain shaker uh, exact right, I think. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Kane. I see there are a lot of questions still. Uh, uh not answered and we are a little bit running late on time but i will just go on asking until uh, manuela stops me from the <laughs> from the back office so uh, there was a really interesting question uh, about uh, rotating uh, uh, floating solar so uh, is there any experience with mooring for rotating solar islands i can first answer and then i leave the word to uh, to real charles i know that there are uh, installed uh, uh, floating system which are tracking the sun. So there are a few providers that uh, say offer this kind of solution, but of course the mooring uh, uh, system that needs to be coupled with those uh, is different. So uh, I don't know if uh, uh, Charles, uh, uh, you want to say something about uh, uh, how you would approach uh, mooring system for tracking floating solar. Uh, yes, we've actually worked with um, a company in Portugal called Solaris Floats uh, that works with one axis and two axis uh, tracking systems. And um, together we, we developed a mooring solution um, that they've currently, is being tested in the TNO project in the Netherlands. Um, so that's something that, that that's it's definitely feasible, is definitely workable, um, and it's a, it's actually a pretty good solution. So uh, combined with the elastic and the, and the axis systems, so uh, definitely, if you're interested in the access uh, solution, it can definitely be moored uh, in the more challenging environments with water level variation and wind. So, yes. Thank you, Charles. Uh, if uh, Kane or to have anything to add on that? Yeah, I mean, I don't have personally any experience with these uh, rotating tracking systems, but. Uh, but uh, I think, as Charles is saying, it's from a technical uh, point of view, it's it's absolutely feasible. But uh, you would, of course, need to consider whether it, it would be uh, involved some increased complexity, right? So you would need to assess whether that uh, associated cost uh, will uh, be more than your production gain in a way. So it's more like a commercial. Uh, uh, assessment I think that needs to to be done as well I think technically it's it's feasible but as well you would probably need to qualify some new technology elements because this has not been at least uh, as I'm aware not been installed yet in in larger larger scale so you would need to to qualify the new new technology components okay Thank you very much, Ture. And there is another really interesting question. Uh, I don't know if uh, there is a, a straight uh, uh, forward uh, uh, answer for that, but uh, we can give it a try. Uh, so uh, Stanislas is asking, uh, what site characteristic would have the biggest impact on anchoring and mooring capex? Would it be the water depth? Would it be the wave and wind loads uh, or the water level variations or a combination of those? Go ahead, Charles. Okay. Um, 
yeah, so um, in some instances like offshore, uh, the wave situation would be the biggest, uh, one of the biggest challenges. Um, we're looking looking at some of the sites or giving consulting with some of the sites that have 18 meter waves, um, but the depths aren't so great. There may be only 50, 60 meters deep, but that's a huge challenge for the waves. Um, and the wind is maybe not the biggest challenge, but then you go to a hydro dam where it's really deep and it has 30 plus meters of variation, but then maybe not so much wind. And then that's the biggest challenge is the is the water level variation with the depths. Um, so it's not really across the board just one particular environmental factor. It's really the project has a specific driving factor. Um, one that we're working in in Asia right now is in the right in the typhoon belt and can have 80 plus meters per second winds, but it's not so challenging with waves and it's not so challenging with water variation. So then that's that's the that's the key criteria. So it it's really not standard across the board, it's something has some big challenge in it. Uh, and it's usually maybe just one, and it may be combined with two, but usually one or so. Yeah, no, I totally agree uh, with, with Charles on that, that uh, that is really the combination and pro each project has their own uh, uh, kind of key, key challenges. What we most often see is of course that the, with respect to, to, to the mooring system, it's the wind that is kind of the governing uh, environmental uh, uh, parameter, but, um, but, but that can vary. But related to that, what I think is a really good advice is that early in a design phase, you should really uh, carry out the proper risk assessment to really systematically address your system and see what are the key risks in uh, in this project um, and then I think it's useful to address the different life cycle phases what design manufacturing installation and operation what what are the key uh, risks uncertainties failure modes uh, associated with these different uh, stages uh, so for instance then in design do you have a an analysis model that can properly capture the physical effects that are here. Uh, in installation, will you use a temporary mooring system? Okay, in that case, what is the capacity of that? Um, and then in, in operation, it's okay, if you're at a lake, for instance, will there be uh, traffic with boats and vessels there? How, how will you make sure that they don't mash, uh, damage your mooring system? Um, so I think it's important to sometimes take a step back and not only jump to the really advanced analysis right away, but rather think about uh, what are kind of the overall risks first. And then if you find that uh, that actually determining the, the responses in the system is really a key challenge, then you start focusing on the analysis. So that will be my, my advice. Thank you very much, Stuart. I think uh, uh, Manuela is uh, trying to communicate with us that we should uh, uh, get close to an end. Uh, so uh, I would like to thank uh, Tore, Charles uh, and Kane for the really interesting presentations and for uh, a nice uh, lively discussion on the questions. Uh, there are still a lot of questions uh, uh, that have been unanswered. So uh, I don't know, Manuela, how we want to follow up on those. I leave that uh, uh, up to you now to uh, explain and close off the, the webinar. And thanks again for organizing that to uh, Solar Plaza. Well, thank you all for this uh, super nice discussion. For me, Thank you, Michaela, for moderating this, uh, this panel. And to all of you panelists, thank you so much for answering all the questions, at least a part of them. So as Michaela said, we've had a, an yeah, incredible amount of questions coming in. And unfortunately, we couldn't get to answer all of them. So our apologies for that, but our time is always a bit limited. And we will share uh, these questions with the panelists, the questions that were not answered. And uh, hopefully, they can follow up later if they are able to. So, but we will make sure that these questions are shared. Uh, thank you so much for sending your questions as well. And uh, yeah, just a bit of a wrap up, we have some upcoming events at Solar Plaza. So we have, of course, the Solar Future, the Netherlands, which is coming up in September. And we have also another super interesting event, which is the Solar Asset Management Europe. And of course, 
the Floating Solar Conference in 28th of September. And we really hope to see you, of course, at the conference and in our other uh, online events. And thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you, Michele, Tora, Charles, and Kane for your presentations and for your great insights and uh, teaching us so much today about uh, anchoring your mooring. So thank you so much all, and I wish you all a very nice day ahead or evening or afternoon, depending on uh, where you are in the world. <laughs> thank you all. Goodbye. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.